we are in part three of uh, a teaching series we kicked off a couple weeks ago called Rethinking Church. And uh, I, I don't know about you, but it, you know, if, if it's been, been good for you, it's been really good for me, uh, if anything. <laughs> so um, what's been good for me is, um, and I, I've really been able to, uh, I, I think, get, personally get under the hood on uh, what the church is really meant to, to be all about. And, and maybe the, the, the point, what we've really been trying to do over the last couple of weeks is, is compare some of the, the, the significant differences we find in Scripture between the early church of the first century and the modern church of the 21st century, right? The church here in 2018. And, you know, as a, as a pastor, as a church leader, right, these are things that I, I see and I, I, uh, I look at and, um, and, and, and wonder if, if maybe the way we do church, the way we function as church, or the way we, you know, define church sometimes personally uh, needs to be, uh, you know, rethought through. Is it something that we need to rethink? Is it something that we need to step back and say, hey, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe some of this um, isn't the way uh, God originally intended the church to function? You know, I, I believe the church, when it began, it began as a movement, that it was always intended to be a movement, not a location, not an institution, not something that, that was fixed and stationary, but something that was moving and advancing. And, and, and somewhere along the way, right, the church in, in, in many parts of the earth um, stopped moving very much at all. And, you know, we, we still see, we still hear stories of the church advancing. I just read a story this morning, um, Charisma Magazine, there was, a, there was an article in there about um, how, how the leaders of, of North Korea um, are, are fearful um, that, that uh, Christianity before long will become the majority religion in, in, in the nation of North Korea. It's un, unbelievable. God is moving. The church is moving in so many pockets of the earth, and yet um, sometimes I think our expression or our experience of church uh, in, in America, in the Western church, is that it doesn't seem to move very much at all. And, and God's original plan was that the church would move that it would advance, that it would impact lives, that it wouldn't just be location-driven, but that it would be people-driven, right? That it wouldn't be pastor-centered, but that it would be people-centered. And these are some of the things that have been heavy on my heart is, is how do we get back to some of those original uh, concepts, those, those, those genius concepts that, that, that you know, make church really much more simple and much more enjoyable and make it um, you know, all about really loving one another and loving the earth and loving, loving the world. And so I want to... Um, I want to just sort of dial in, you know, I, I, we, um, we were looking at some things that I think are, are, are really important, things that are critical, some things that, 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 that maybe concern me, you know, to some degree, and, and so the whole point through all of this maybe is that we would begin to rethink church, our thinking of church, we'd rethink that, and, and maybe as we come through this series here in a month or two months, however long we stick in the book of Acts, I haven't really decided uh, yeah, but, but as, we, as we come through this series, I, you know, my hope, goal is that maybe, maybe we would, some of us, begin to redefine, uh, maybe in our hearts, what, what church is really supposed to be all about. And it would cause us to live differently. It would cause us to walk differently. And um, I think so much of what has caused the church to, start, to stop moving, we talked about last week, was, uh, has been... Um, when, when the, as the church has begun to look more inward and be more inward focused, um, it has it has really stopped advancing in lots of areas. And uh, I think it's it, you know it's easy for the church to just look at themselves and and to be more uh, more focused on those who are reached and those who are unreached. Um, to be more concerned about what's happening inside the church than what's happening outside the church. Right? I, I th- like I, I said um, to you last week. You know, if 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 you know you stared at your face in the mirror long enough, you would have. Uh, you know, pl- it'd be easy for you to start to point out all your flaws. Well, man, as we as a church look at our church in the mirror long enough because we're so focused inward, it's really easy to point out all the flaws. And it gets us off mission. It gets us off purpose. And the church stops advancing, and it just sort of starts to, 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 uh, to sputter. And so um, let's, let's look today at, at uh, how we can rethink church. And um, the challenge for us is going to be to see the church the way it was— uh, uh, you know, originally planned, the way it got started, because when the church began, um, it did not begin as a, as, as a building, right? It, it did not begin as an institution or even as a hierarchy. Uh, when the church began, it began as a movement 2,000 years ago with 120 people who, you know, spilled into the streets of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost with a very simple message that Jesus was the living Christ, the Son of the living God, right? I mean, you think about 
the significance of that day when the church was born on the day of Pentecost. I mean, these are people who had an incredible encounter with the Holy Spirit, and something in, it happened inside of them. There was this boldness almost infused into them, and they went from a place of hiding to, to actually coming out into the streets and sharing this simple message that Jesus was the risen Christ, the Son of the living God. And I think sometimes one of the things we fail to see is that when the church launched, it did not launch around the teachings of Jesus. Did you know that? When, when the church launched, it did not launch around the teachings of Jesus. It did not even launch around the activities of Jesus. When the church launched, it launched around an event, the resurrection of Jesus, right? It launched around a, a bunch of people who were eyewitnesses to an event that actually took place. These were people who saw Jesus die, and these were people who were eyewitnesses to the fact that he was no longer dead, but that he was alive. The church launched around an event, the most incredible event that has ever taken place in the history of the earth. And, and on opening day, when Peter stands up in Acts chapter 2, and he gives the first sermon in the history of the church, 3,000 people give their faith, give their life to Jesus Christ. They put their trust in Jesus as the Messiah. Unbelievable, right? It's the scandalous message in Jerusalem in that time. It's, it's a message that would get you arrested. It's a message that would get you persecuted. And on day one, as he stands up, 3,000 people give their life to follow Jesus. And in just a couple weeks, 5,000 men have given their life to follow Jesus. The church is just a couple weeks old. And 5,000 men, so you count women and children, and you consider the population of Jerusalem in that day. In just a couple weeks, the the, this new movement accounts for over 10% of the city of Jerusalem that day. It's unbelievable to see how this thing started and how it accelerated and how it moved. And it was just picking up steam and it wasn't slowing down anytime soon. As you read in Acts, you find this church would just continue to move forward and accelerate. And what's so interesting to me is that it had nothing to do with buildings and it had nothing to do with hierarchy. It had everything to do with the fact that, that, you know, just down the road and around the corner, this man, Jesus, as they were talking about, that he, he was crucified, like right down there. This, this man that they were talking about just down the road from where he was crucified is where he rose from the dead. And these people were speaking about an event that they had witnessed, that they had seen, that they had an experience, and it was life-changing, and they just couldn't shut up about it, Right? I mean, I, I don't know, like if, if I had witnessed and experienced something quite like that, I, I, think, I think it'd be something that would be hard for me to stop talking about. Here's the deal, here's the deal. We can easily just put that in category and say, well, you know, like they, they actually were eyewitnesses. You know, I, I get why they are so bold. It's a little bit different for me. If I saw something like that today, like I'd be pretty bold too. And I think we dis discount the, the significance of what Jesus has done in our own lives that the power of God has hit your life and hit my life and it has resurrected my soul, brought me from, from death to life, right? That that, that is, that I, I today in 2018 am also an eyewitness to the fact that, that there is resurrection power still at work today. And these people were eyewitnesses to what had happened and I think we have the opportunity to be eyewitnesses as well. So, so simply stated, right, when the church began, it began as a gathering of people who came together around one idea, one idea, that Jesus was the risen Christ, the son of the living God. And that was all that they had, right? That's it. They didn't have buildings, right? They didn't have budgets. They didn't have robes, right? They didn't have, have pews. They didn't have liturgy and stained glass and steeples. They didn't have any of that stuff. All they had was this message that Jesus was the living Christ, the son of the living God. And somehow that was enough for them. And the church took off, and it began to move. And, and, and what you read very quickly is just as, almost just as fast as the church began to move, it, it, it began to face extreme opposition and extreme resistance. You see, once the church began to move, it was met with opposition. People who did not want this thing to get out, did not want this thing to advance, did not want it to, uh, to be spread throughout Jerusalem for sure and beyond there. And this is, this is maybe the, the lesson we can, we can pull away from that, that, that thought, that idea that the church faced. I think that just about anything God ever asks of you will be met with resistance of some kind. 
Just about anything God ever asks of you will be met with some sort of resistance. Did you know that? Have you experienced that in your life? I mean, can you bear witness to that? That just about anything God asks of you in life will be met with some kind of opposition, some kind of resistance. Maybe it's internal, maybe it's external, but it will not be easy. God, God never, never calls us to a path. He never invites us on a journey that's going to be just simple and easy, right? He invites us into one that is right and one that is best, but rarely is it easy. And what I think is so interesting is, is uh, that these people who started the church in Acts chapter 2, you find as you continue to read in Acts that they would be arrested, they would be flogged, Many of them would even give their life to ensure that the message of the resurrection of Jesus went across the earth, right? But when you look at their response, how they respond to the opposition and how they respond to the resistance, it's remarkable because their response was to pray. We talked about this last week. It was, they, they responded with prayer. Right? And, and maybe that's, that's not, not too remarkable because maybe some of us, if we're facing persecution, maybe that's our go-to too is, you know, we're going to start to pray. And what you see here is that their response to a kind of opposition that would threaten their livelihood, that would threaten their reputation, that would threaten their lives, their response to that kind of opposition was to pray. But not pray like, like we would expect them to pray. And not, not maybe pray like many of us would pray. They did not pray for protection, right? And they did not even pray here for, for the opposition to stop, for the resistance to go away. I, want, I mean, it, how would you pray, right? How would you pray in these moments? How would you pray if this was your experience? And, you know, you're putting it all out there on the line for Jesus and you're, you know, you're being bold for, for, for the sake of the gospel and uh, you're facing all of this persecution, you're being arrested, you're being beaten, you're being flogged. And, and uh, I mean, how would you pray? I, probably for some protection, right? Probably for the, for the opposition to stop, for the floggings to come to an end, right? But this isn't how they prayed. Like the early church, the first 120, those people who got together and those who were arrested, the apostles, they prayed for boldness, Scripture tells us. They didn't pray for, they didn't pray for, the, res, for the resistance to go away. They didn't pray for the persecution to stop. They, they prayed for more boldness. And look, look at here in Acts chapter 4. A scripture I shared with you last week, it says this was their prayer right after Peter and John were released from prison, the very first who were arrested for the sake of the gospel. It says, and now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they, pre then they preached the word of God with boldness. Isn't that remarkable? Isn't it remarkable that their, 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 their first reaction after being released from jail and coming together and saying, hey, we got to pray. This thing is getting out of hand, right? The, like, people, people are resisting this message, you know. Uh, is, their first reaction is to pray for more boldness. God, strengthen us. Make us bold for you. Can you I mean, it's, it's just, it's just mind-boggling to me. It, it, it's amazing to me that they would ask for boldness, right? I mean, this is what got them thrown in jail. Boldness is what got them thrown in jail. I mean, they still smell like jail, and they're asking for more boldness, right? I mean, they just came from jail. And, and they're, they're asking for more of the very thing that got them put in jail. Now, here's, here's the difference. One of the things you see about the, the early church is that you see, you see people who were not just okay with, hey, you know, I'm saved, and um, now I'm just going to kind of live life and wait until heaven gets here, right? These, these weren't those kinds of people. And I think sometimes maybe the, the modern church, the church of the 21st century, is, is, it can be described kind of like that. A bunch of people who put their faith in Jesus and then just sort of exist until heaven someday. I mean, that's, that's, that's like the, the, the goal. It's just, I got I to kind of get through. I got to kind of exist. I kind of, you know, you know, keep my morality in check and, and do some good things between now and there and, and get to heaven. That's the goal. Just, I got I to gotta, gotta get to heaven. And what you see in the early church that I think you struggle to find in the modern church is this type of outrageous boldness. Don't you see that? When you read Acts, don't you see that? It's just this outrageous boldness. It's, it's like it had me in tears as I've read through this book. And I'm looking inward and I'm saying, man, what is wrong with me? 
I'm thinking, man, why? Why do I like, you know, miss, miss those moments because I'm, you know, too afraid or, or I just, whatever. And, and, and I just see a church that is just outrageously bold. You see these outrageously bold prayers, don't you? Like outrageously bold prayers. Bold prayers for healing, like it says here in Acts 4, for healing and miraculous signs for people to come to faith in Jesus Christ. You see it in this prayer. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. You see these outrageously bold prayers. And I don't know, I don't know about you. I, I, me, I, I think it's time. I think it's time for the church to pray outrageously bold prayers once again. I think it's time, I think the time has come for the church to begin to pray outrageously bold prayers once again. And here, here's, here's the deal, because prayer, I, I believe, changes things. Prayer is, 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 is much more of a, of, of a weapon than you realize sometimes. Prayer actually changes things. It impacts outcomes. It moves the heart of God. And I believe that it's time for the church to begin to pray outrageously bold prayers once again and and, and one of the things you need to look at as you look at your prayer life is, is, is what you pray for and how you pray because um, how you pray reveals what you believe about God. Did you know that? How you pray reveals what you believe about God. So, so if, if you rarely pray, there, there's a chance, if you rarely pray, there's a chance that, um, you, that you don't believe that God really answers prayers. Or, or that God really, really is moved by prayer, that, that it's more of like a religious thing. If, if you don't pray, pray very, very often at all, there's the chance that you've come to a place in your life. And maybe it's, it's because, like, you know, you, you, you prayed for something and you didn't see the answer you had hoped for, and, and it just kind of got you, you know, uh, frustrated with prayer or unsure how this whole thing works, not sure what the magic formula is to get God to say yes. And so it's got you kind of disillusioned with this whole idea of prayer. But how you pray reveals what you believe about God. And if you, pr- if you rarely pray, chances are it's because you, b- you, you don't maybe, maybe believe that, that God doesn't answer prayer. If you pray small prayers, right? How many of us pray small prayers all the time? Like, give me a, God, God just bless our, bless our day. Can you give me a good day today? Like, really? Like, you know, like a, that's, that's like the highlight of our prayer life is, is just bless this day, God, and we have a good <laughs> Good day, and, and uh, we pray small prayers, you know, protect us, keep us safe, you know, watch over us. And I mean, the same prayers like day after day after day. And, and uh, I think sometimes if, you know, if, if, we, um, if we pray small prayers, um, it, it, it may show us that uh, we lack faith in a big God. That, that we have enough faith to believe in a small God, but not enough faith to believe in a big God. And so we find ourselves maybe not praying for the big things like we, you know, should be praying. And, and, and maybe, maybe, though, as you look at your prayer life, maybe it's more, um, more self-centered prayers or selfish prayers. And that, that really comes from a, a belief that God exists for you, that he exists for you and he exists for me, that God, the whole purpose of his existence is for us. And it's, it's really... Truly the other way around, right? We exist for him. He doesn't exist for us. And isn't it strange that we live in like the safest, freest uh, nation in the world? Like truly, like one of, one of the safest, one of the freest nations in the world. And yet most, and most of us live in like the safest parts of the safest, freest nation in the world, right? The suburbs. We live in like, I mean, in the Bible Belt. And we live in Iowa. Like no one's coming here to cause problems, right? I mean, it's the safest, one of the safest places in the world, and, and yet still most of our prayers center around safety for us, for our kids, for our family, right? Most of our prayers center, center around safety. They're like, safest place in the world to live, and we pray for safety, right? Here's the deal. Insider prayers and inward thinking have been the things that have kept the church from moving, okay? Now here, I'm not saying don't pray for your family. I'm not, you heard me last week say that. I'm not saying don't pray for your family, don't, don't pray for safety. I'm not saying those are wrong things to pray. What I'm saying is when that is like, like all you pray for, when that is the majority of how you pray, when it's very inward focused and, and, and inward thinking, when it's an insider type prayer, uh, and that's all you have in your prayer life, that's what causes the church to stop moving. When your heart doesn't beat for the things that God's heart beats for, right? His heart beats for a lost world, a, a, a broken and a hurting world. And when our prayers when our prayers never line up with the heartbeat of God, we have to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, what is going on inside of me right now? 
What is happening inside of me when, when my prayer life never lines up with the heartbeat of God? We have to pray outward-focused prayers. We have to have outward-focused churches. We have to look outward. When we look inward, that's where we have so many, so many problems. And so I, I think that, that one of the biggest things you see in the church of the first century that you struggle sometimes to see in the church of the 21st century is this incredible boldness, right? And boldness is behavior that is born out of belief, right? What you see in the early church is you see this incredible belief that Jesus actually came back to life, that he was the Messiah, that he was the hope of the world. You see this belief in them, this unshakable belief. And what happened? Like the byproduct was this like unthinkable behavior that just started to come out of them. Like, you know, they, they're arrested and then they, they, you know, you think that maybe that would stop them from speaking in the name of Jesus, but they just go back out and do it again. Like, hey, you realize you're going to get arrested again. What are you doing? You know, that's, the, that's craziness. Just, just sort of, you know, blend in and be quiet about it. Maybe find one person you can sort of, you know, move over to the side and, and, and just sort of talk one-on-one -on -one with. This wasn't their style. They, they believed something was real. They believed in Jesus believed he was the hope of the world, and what did it do? It, 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 it created behavior out of them that, 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 that was just unthinkable. Like, who acts like that? What you believe determines how you behave. So, so let me frame that up for you. Like, if, if, if you're worried about what people think of you, anybody, you ever, ever been there? You ever just been worried about what people think? You ever been worried about, like, people's criticism, right? I think it's, you know, a lot of us, like, I've been there. Like, you know, you, you, if, if, that's, if that's how you think, if that's how you believe, if you're worried about what people think, if you're worried about criticism, then, then you're going to be timid in life, right? You're going to be real timid. If, uh, if you're afraid to fail, anybody ever been afraid to fail? You just fear of failure, afraid of failure? What, what, what does that do to you? causes you to be like ultra cautious, right? It causes you to be like, you know, indecisive and, 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 and it informs your behavior. It impacts your behavior. But what if you believe that God could really do anything? What if that was like really at the core of who you were? Like God could really do anything. I, I, I just wonder if, if, if we would start to see boldness like come out of us. Like, and, you know, I think maybe where you start to shut me off and tune me out a little bit here today is, is maybe how you interpret boldness. I think maybe, maybe you hear me speak of boldness and you compare it to the church and you think, well, man, I'm not going to be able to go out there and, like, preach. I'm not going to be able to get up there and give, give a message, you know, like Peter or, you know, like Pastor Jordan does every week. And, and, and I think you misinterpret what boldness is really all about because when you look at their lives, the early church, you see some outrageous boldness, not just in the way they spoke. I think more importantly, you see it in how they lived. You see, you see that they lived with boldness. It was in their life. It was, they had this answer within them. They, they lived like, like uh, some of the verses we skipped over in Acts um, 5 that we're going to get here today we didn't have time for, but you see them live with this like, like outrageously bold generosity. They just loved each other like so much. It was just outrageously bold love and generosity. And you see this, these outrageously bold prayers that they, they pray and believe that God can do and and I think sometimes we let ourselves off the hook because we say, well, you know, I'm just like an introvert. I'm just, you know, that's just not my style. I just don't, I just don't do that. Well, that's, that's okay. I mean, you can, you can use that excuse if you want. I, I would just ask you to, like, find a verse or two that, like, lets you off the hook in Scripture, right? You know, like, like you have to live boldly. You live boldly for the gospel. We live in a country where boldness about our faith will cost us almost nothing, and yet so many times we lack boldness, don't we? Like it'll cost us nothing. So I, I, I don't say any of this to like make us feel bad, even if you do feel bad. You know, that's, that's not me, right? That's the like Holy Spirit, right, bringing conviction on you right now. But uh, here's the point. If the early church had been safety conscious instead of bold, like the message of Jesus uh, would have disappeared within six months of the resurrection, Right? The message of Jesus would not have gotten past the first century if, if, if the, the, the early church would have been safety conscious instead of bold. And I think you see some incredible things here in, in the first few chapters of Acts. You see some things that cause me to look at myself in the mirror and go, what is going on? What am I really doing? Why, why, why am I so inward focused all the time? And you see these men and these women who are just so focused on um, who God has made them to be and getting the message of Jesus to as many people as possible. Look at Acts 5. Uh, as, we, as we flip the page to Acts 5 today, uh, in verse 12. So we ended right where they had just been released from prison and they had gone together and they had prayed for more, more boldness. 
Here's, here's how the story picks up. It says, the apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. So, so they're doing the very things they had prayed for, right? They had, and they asked God, stretch out your hands. Stretch out your hands so that, so that many miraculous signs and wonders can happen through the name of your, of your servant, Jesus, right? That's what they prayed. And then you find in chapter 5 that they are performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And it says, and all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade. But no one else dared to join them, even though all the people had, re- had high regard for them. And so what's happening here is, is the believers are coming together. They're coming to the temple. And, and they're sort of, you know, kind of gathering in their group, right? They're, they're, uh, they're Jesus click, right? They're, they're kind of coming together. And there's other people who are there at the temple, Jewish people, who see what they're doing, see what they're all about, even hear some of their message. And, and they had high regard for them, but, uh, but they didn't dare join them because there was this fear of persecution, right? It was illegal to do what these guys were doing. In verse 14 says, Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord. Crowds of both men and women. As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. Can you, I mean, do not just like read that and move on. Like, can you imagine that? Like, insert yourself into the story in Acts chapter 5 here. I mean, I mean, the, the fame is, 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 is out of hand. The, 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 the commotion is out of hand in Jerusalem. I mean, these people are, are, are everywhere they're going, right? The, the apostles are performing many miraculous signs to the point that the word has gotten out and people are actually bringing their sick relatives on their deathbed into the street, not even, not even to, to get Peter to pray for them, but just to get his shadow to fall on them so that maybe they'll get healed just because they were, they were around Peter. That's ridiculous. Is that not? That's ridiculous. That's amazing. Unbelievable. It says in verse 16, it says, Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits. It says, and they were all healed. What I love about these verses here, I love about this, is that after they prayed for boldness, they then spoke boldly about what they had seen. Not what they believed, about what they'd seen. What they'd seen God do. What they'd seen God do. They spoke about what they'd seen, not just what they believed. They spoke about what they had seen. They had seen a risen Christ, and, they, and it gave them this boldness because they had seen God do something incredible. And it, wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just boldness that, that was informed by their belief. It was born by what they had seen. And so, so here's, here's the struggle sometimes in churches is we have people all, the, all, all, over, all over the country, all over the Western church, kids growing up in church, and they're not, they're not experiencing God. They're getting a lot of information about God. They're being informed about God, right? They're, they're, to where enough to form a belief about God, But I, I get concerned when I look at the church of the 21st century, the modern church, and I wonder, are we really experiencing God at a level that will infuse boldness into our life, that will cause us to speak up and to give an answer for the hope that is within us? I think too often, too often, we let ourselves just sort of, sort of frame up some spiritual belief that is not backed up by any sort of experience at all. An experience, what they'd seen God do. I can tell you that you can, you can frame up a belief that God can heal a sick person. But once you have seen God heal a sick person, it changes the way that you live your life. Like it changes the way that you pray. It changes the way, the way what you expect to happen. It gives you faith. It builds your, your, you know, your, uh, your confidence in God that he can really do anything, that he's as big as he says he is. And I believe that the church of the 21st century, I think the modern church, our church, really could use a lot more experience of God, not just, not, just, not just information that informs their belief, right? So then what you see here is you see their outrageously bold prayers, right? Outrageously bold prayers. And then you see some outrageously bold obedience. That's where I kind of want to spend the, the, the rest of our time together this morning, looking at, at this bold obedience you find in, uh, in the apostles and, and the early church. It says in, in, in the next verse here, in verse 17, it says the high priests and officials who were Sadducees uh, were filled with jealousy. Here's the reason why. The Sadducees, 
Right? These, are, these are like another type of Pharisee, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. The Sadducees um, like did not believe at all in the resurrection of, of, of the dead. They didn't believe that that was possible, didn't believe that that would ever happen. And, uh, and so these guys, oh, that's all they're speaking about, right, is the resurrection of Jesus. So they're incredibly angry, and they're filled with jealousy because uh, these guys are doing things they don't have an explanation for. Right? These are the religious elite over here, and they're jealous that these guys are seeing miraculous signs and wonders. And so um, it says in all the believers, um, it says in verse 18, they arrested the apostles, put them in the public jail. Now, you've got you to pay close attention and start to catch this. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail, and brought them out. Okay? Uh, then he told them, go to the temple and give the people this message of life. So at daybreak, the apostles entered the temple, as they were told, and immediately began teaching. I look at this story, and I, I think about, I mean, this is an incredible miracle that they just experienced, isn't it? They just experienced a, a, like, like a divine encounter where an angel of God uh, shows up in their prison cell and releases them from jail, like in the middle of the night, and then gives them orders and tells them to go back into the temple and to begin to, to teach uh, the people. And what I, I, I asked myself this question this week. I said, you know, what, what was it, what was it that, that caused this miracle to be released to them? What, what, what released the miracle to them? I think it had a lot to do with them living in obedience, don't you think? I think it had a lot to do with them living in obedience to, to what God had asked them to do. It wasn't just enough for them to pray for boldness, but they began to live with boldness. And it had a lot to do with their obedience. You see this in, the, in verse 21. It says, immediately they began teaching. Immediately they, 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 they enter the, 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 the temple. Immediately when they leave the jail, they enter the temple and they, uh, they begin teaching just as the angel had instructed them to do. Um, man, I, I'm thinking, man, don't they need time to consider this request? I mean, they had just been arrested. Like, they had just been thrown in jail. I mean, they had just been thrown in jail. I mean, don't you think, like, hey, maybe we should consider this request just a little bit? I mean, don't they need to determine if it's worth it to obey God in this story? Is it worth it? Like, is my life worth it? see this bold obedience, don't you? And I don't know if, um, if you're a parent in here today, like, um, you know, how many of y'all know that, like, delayed obedience is still disobedience, right? It's like one of the, one of the biggest challenges in parenting, right, is delayed. It's like, you know, like, how long does it take you to, like, you know, like, s s slither off the couch and, you know, go pick up the toys I told you to, to pick up, you know? Like, delayed obedience is still disobedience, like, no matter what, right? It's like, I, I appreciate the fact that eventually, you know, you, you found time to listen to me, but it's still disobedience, and I'm not going to, like, allow that, right? I mean, it's, it's just the way it goes, right? You see, uh, as a parent, you, you see that, like, partial obedience is, is still disobedience, isn't it? Like partial, partial obedience. And I think, I think this is sometimes where we struggle as Christians is like we mostly obey, right? Like we, we mostly uh, listen to God. We, we do, you know, a, 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 you know we, a high percentage of, of obedience, um, but not complete. And many times it's conditional. Like as long as I like the results, I'm going to obey, right? I think most of the time in, in a lot of our lives, like that's, that's, that's how we look at whether or not we're going to obey God, and it becomes this, like, thing we consider, this thing that we evaluate. We, we weigh the, the pros and the cons, and, and you know, I, I get it, because I, I understand that, like, the risk is significant for us to just blindly obey God. It's a significant risk. I'm not going to lie, but, but I don't see this, like, internal battle. I don't see this, like, pause to consider the request. I see this immediate obedience to God, immediate obedience it goes on, the rest of the story goes like this. It says, when the high priests and his officials arrived, they convened the high council, the full assembly of the elders of Israel. Then they sent for the apostles to be brought from the jail for trial. But when the temple guards went to the jail, the men were gone, right? So they returned to the council and reported, the jail was securely locked with the guards standing outside, but when we opened the gates, no one was there. When the captain of the temple guard and the leading priest heard this, they were perplexed, wondering, wondering where it would all end. Then someone arrived with startling news. The men you put in jail are standing in the temple teaching the people, right? Uh, the, the captain went with his temple guards and arrested the apostles, but without violence, 
for they were afraid the people would stone them. <laughs> Here, here's the deal. These guys are just obeying God, aren't they? Like the only reason they're in the temple is because God asked them to go to the temple and to speak, to teach the people. And I think what that shows us is that obedience to God is usually met with resistance or opposition. Obedience to God oftentimes is going to be met with resistance or opposition. I mean, these guys are arrested for the second time in like a day. It's not a good day for them. It's the second time they've been arrested for doing the same thing. It's, it's like, man, you know, like we make fun of those people, and, you know, or, or we, we laugh at like, could you really get arrested for the same exact thing? You didn't learn your lesson. And these, guys, these guys get arrested for the same exact thing. This is why when you, be, when you obey, it doesn't usually get easier, right? That's, that's why. In many cases, it actually becomes harder, um, and it always requires, requires faith. Obedience to God always requires faith. Many times, it becomes harder, not easier. Um, that's the good news for you today, right? That's, that's the feel-good message is that when you obey God, it's probably going to get harder. I think sometimes that's the misconception. I follow God. Life's going to start to straighten out, start to look, look better. You know, all my needs are going to be met. That's not what it means at all. That's not what it means at all. It means, it means that life, life will improve. Life will feel more, more fulfilled. You will, uh, you will have purpose in life, but um, it doesn't necessarily get easier. And I think the reason why is because obedience doesn't exist in a vacuum. Right, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't exist like separate from all the other uh, realities of life that, that impact you. All, all the other voices, all the other realities that you face day in and day out. And, and so it's tough to follow through. So you think about your life and you think, man, so what are some of the things that God would ask me to obey him in? What are the things he's asked me to do that I need to follow through on? You know, some people it's, it's this, you know, hey, you know, maybe God's bringing you through a time of, um, you know, it's time to get out of debt. It's time to put a plan in order and get out of debt, right? Maybe you felt that. And, and I can just about guarantee you that as you begin to put that plan together and then begin to implement it, you will face opposition and you will face resistance. Why are you doing that? You shouldn't be doing that. I, I, like, and you'll feel it internally. Man, I need to like, I really need to buy that or I really need to do, you know, and, and you will feel this, this uh, resistance, this opposition, because obedience doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists in, 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 uh, in, in, a, in a place where there is all kinds of pressure that wants to keep you from following through on a commitment to God. I think sometimes people you know, feel like, hey, we've got to up the ante in our spiritual life. We've got to attend church more regularly. We've got to get involved in a life group. We, we need, to, uh, we, we need to, to become more spiritually solid. And they begin to feel God, the Holy Spirit, leading them to make that type of commitment. Um, and yet they find the follow-through is so much more difficult like, they, they find the desire to obey, but as they start to obey, they feel this internal resistance or this opposition. Man, I really want to, like, take Sunday off this week, right? I, I really think that'd be nice to do. Or I really feel like, you know, I don't know that I need, need to be involved in a life group. And you start to feel some of this, this, uh, this pressure to maybe not walk out the very things that God has asked you to do. You find this with people who decide to start tithing, and they feel like, oh, my gosh, like, what am I doing? You know, this is, does not make any sense mathematically, and yet, for whatever reason, like, you know, they just, uh, you know, they just obey God, and, and God starts to, to really work with them through that process and provide for every need that they have, and yet it's such a leap of faith, right? Because obedience requires faith. So here's, here's, here's a thought for you today. Until you're ready to face opposition for your obedience to God, you won't be ready to be used by God. I, I, I really believe that. God, use me. God, how would you want to use me? How would you want to use my life? Well, until you're willing to, 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 to experience some opposition for your obedience to God, you won't be ready to be used by him. It brings me to some questions today, right? Malia, you can come on up. It brings me to some questions today, right? Like, like why do we lack boldness? You know, why, why is that the case? You know, I, I think about that a lot. I'm kind of in this, this personal study of the early church and Asking myself these questions. Why, why is it tough? Why, why in my own life do I sometimes just lack boldness? I mean, I truly love Jesus. Like, he's changed my life. Like, I'm not the same man, uh, you know, because of what he's done for me. And, and yet sometimes I even lack boldness when I, you know, why? I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's, maybe we get too distracted by life, do you think? Maybe we get too busy. Maybe we get too successful sometimes. Like, God answered all our prayers and so we're safe, you know? Like, yeah. We're making it in life, and I think sometimes we forget the difference that Christ has made in our lives, right? We, we, uh, we forget what it was like to live without hope. 
You know, I, I don't know maybe where you were before you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but I think for a lot of us, like, you know, the longer you, you follow Jesus, the, the further away you get from that significant moment, and, and you start to forget what it was like to live without hope. And so boldness just sort of tapers off. It sort of just kind of dulls itself down. And I think some of us maybe, you know, if you've been around church for the majority of your life, like maybe you, you've never even known what life was like without hope. You know, like, I've just been in church. I've always gone to church, so I don't know. You don't really have, like, a, like maybe a, a real uh, experience of living without hope in life. Always been in church. Like, no one ever needed to be bold with me, like, to get me to believe in God. And so, you, you know, the byproduct is, I, I, you know, I don't see myself naturally being bold with someone else to get them to believe in Christ. And I could never, I could never say that or do that or this or whatever, and but, but, man, somebody in my life needed to be bold with me. Like, right? Like, for me to, like, start to want to put my faith in Christ. And I just wonder if God would want to activate something in you and in me. That would uh, maybe change the way that we live. That would maybe... Um, cause us to see people differently. Start to believe in the church again. As more than just a country club or a time to, you know, just see our friends, but as a force in this world. See the church as something that is moving, something that is changing lives. We have a responsibility, I believe, to pack out heaven, take as many people with us as possible, Last couple scriptures says the apostles left the high council, right? They're released. Unbelievable story. You can read in there, but they're released all because a man speaks up. His name's Gamaliel. Speaks up and he says, you know, these guys, you know, if it's just a fad, it's all going to fizzle out. He goes, but if, if God's doing something, then uh, we don't want to like uh, fight against God. So let's release them and just see what happens. And they're released. Um, the the apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. Every day, house to house, in the temple, teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. So I asked myself this question this week as we start to close, you know, like, how amazed are people by my boldness? Because in Acts 4, they have this experience, right, where the, where the Sanhedrin is this religious high court. Look at Peter and John, and they, they are amazed by their boldness. Even though they don't disagree with them, they're amazed by their boldness. Like, like has anybody ever been amazed by my boldness? It, how amazed are people by your boldness? Like, if you rated it, you know, one to ten. Like, where would you maybe fall on that scale? Where do I, where do I fall on that scale? Like one to ten. How amazed are people by your boldness? Right? I mean, he, he says he's a Christian, you know, but speaks and jokes just like everybody else. You know, how... How, how do people rate your boldness for Jesus Christ? He just sort of, you know, blends in, just sort of laughs along with everybody else, just sort of talks like everybody else. You know, he lets words fly out of his mouth that probably shouldn't come out of his mouth. Like, how amazed are people by your boldness for Jesus? You know, always has to get the last word in, right? Always can't walk away from a disagreement. How, how amazed are people by your boldness? You see, boldness requires you to live differently, Right? Totally, like we live differently. There, there should be a, a noticeable difference in your life and my life. And it's not about getting up and preaching a sermon, guys. It's not about that. It's about letting my life do so much of the talking. But when someone needs to know, I don't just shrink back. I don't get afraid. I'm like, man, he's changed my life. Like, I don't have all the answers. I don't know every scripture. You know, I haven't gone to Bible college, which you don't need to do to give an answer for the hope that is within you. So how do we get bold, right? I gotta spend time with Jesus, which builds my faith, 
which produces boldness, produces the results that we're looking for in the church. Spending time with Jesus, which builds my faith, which builds my boldness, that produces the results of a church that is moving and advancing and bringing people into the kingdom of God. Spiritual boldness comes from knowing Christ, church. It comes from knowing Christ. Hmm. Would you stand with me this morning? I said all of that to tell you that boldness is not the goal. Knowing Jesus is the goal. Right? Knowing Jesus is the goal. As I get to know Jesus, as I spend time with him, it builds my faith. It strengthens me. It gives me hope. It, it causes me to rise above the circumstances that I'm facing. I start to see that there's, there's more happening around me than, than what I just see in the natural. My faith builds, and as a result, I become more bold about my faith. I just, I just do. I just I say, hey, you know, like, you know, uh, I, I, I know that God can step in. I know that he can heal. I know that he can prov you know, provide a you know, miraculous provision for somebody. I, I know. I just have seen it. I've experienced it. I know that there is a God that is bigger than the circumstances that we're facing. And boldness just starts to rise up when you. Someone you hear about is sick and, and you just, you pray differently because you're spending time with God and your faith is rising and there's this boldness in your prayer. There's boldness in your prayer. You start to just declare and decree that, that, that the healing power of God would touch their body and change the outcome. You start to hear about friends who are going through financial difficulty and your prayers change. They become much more bold as you believe for miraculous provision and relationships that are struggling, marriages that are maybe you know, on the brink of collapse and something inside of you just rises up because you spent time with Jesus and it's built your, built your faith. But this boldness just erupts in you that says this does not have to be the way it ends up and you start to pray for God to change outcomes. Church, like this is who we are meant to be, to see things in the natural and believe that God has another way, to believe that God has another outcome. And that's the church we're trying to be, right? Not a church that's building-centered, location-driven, a church that's people-driven, a church that sees people everywhere that we go and sees people that need Jesus and are burdened for the thing that he's burdened for, who have hearts that beat for the things that his heart beats for. Amen? Amen. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, today we come before you. Lord, I thank you for my friends here. Lord, what a privilege it is to serve them as their pastor. And Lord, I just thank you for the journey that we're all on. Um, Lord, that we would just, uh, on this journey, just begin to look more and more like you and less and less like ourselves, I'm reminded in John where he says that you've got to become greater. I've got to become less. Lord, would we decrease so that you can increase? Lord, I just pray that you would increase in the lives of every person here this morning under the sound of my voice. And God, I thank you for the faith that is in here, the faith that we start with here today. God, would you blow up our faith? Would you increase our faith? Lord, would we start to see things in the natural and yet understand in our spirit, man, that the story is not over, that there's more that we believe in a God who can look at things in the natural and alter the outcome. Lord, I pray that faith would rise in here today. I pray that boldness would erupt inside of us, that our heart would start to beat for the very things that your heart beats for. Lord, boldness would rise up inside of us. God, not so that we could be crazy and weird and stand on a street corner, but so that the world that is lost and dying and hurting could know hope, could understand that there is a God that loves them passionately. And God, may we keep our eyes focused on what matters, what matters here. May we not get too successful to be bold. May we not get so focused on ourselves that we just sort of exist until heaven comes one day. God, may we be faithful with the tasks that you've given us here on earth. May we see our neighbors. May we see our friends. May we see our coworkers. May we see those we don't even know that we pass by as people that need to know Jesus Christ. God, open up doors. Every person in here, God, open up a door this week. I just pray for a divine opportunity, just a moment that they couldn't have created on their own to give an answer for the hope that lies within them. God, make a way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Man, come on. He's good, amen? He's good. Jesus is good. He's so good. Man, I, uh, man, I love you guys so much. It's such a great honor and privilege to pastor here. And, um, man, let's be the church, amen? Let's be the people he's called us to be. We'll see you next week.